Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Clay Meredith. I'm with the Albuquerque Biopark. Uh, welcome to the second of the Redlist Units webinar series this year. Um, this week, we'll be talking about mapping species distributions for the IUCN Redlist. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. My colleague, Anna Walker, will be helping to monitor the chat and manage questions. Um, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A function, which should be at the bottom of your screen there. Um, if you have questions and you enter those in, uh, Anna will answer some of the ones um, that, that are easy to answer via text, um, things that are kind of more broadly applicable, she'll elevate up and bring to my attention, we'll kind of uh, keep this informal and she can uh, interrupt me. So we'll, we'll take questions throughout. Um, if you've got anything, please just drop it in there right away. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're, we're really happy to put on this, uh, this webinar and to assist people with mapping. Um, it's a it's a major bottleneck in the redless unit and a, a really, really difficult step for a lot of red listers. Um, they, they have trouble with with mapping. It's kind of a daunting task and it's a bit vaguely worded in terms of what's expected. Um, so we're really hoping to clear up some of these these issues. And um, this webinar is really intended for uh, people who have very limited GIS experience. So if you if you uh, are, are brand new to GIS, this is a webinar intended for you. Um, oh, uh, uh, Anna's got a bit of a technical issue here. Um, huh. There we go. Got it. Thanks. Sorry. Um, so let's get started. Uh, first off, uh, maps are required supporting information. Uh, so this is a brand new uh, rule within the IUCN that every IUCN assessment must come with a map. Um, and maps are a key component of all IUCN red list assessments. Um, the, the exception to the requirement for assessments uh, is for species listed as data deficient for which the distribution is unknown. Um, so if a species is only known from the type specimen, uh, and there's no associated location data, then you don't need to produce a map. Um, maps are a required component because they provide a means for basic analysis. Um, and it's important when creating maps or analyzing spatial data to understand the purpose of the map. Um, so that's one of the things that we're gonna address first. Uh, maps can be generated in a wide variety of formats and submitted to the Red List unit in a, via a variety of platforms. Um, there's some more information on that in the, the mapping guidelines and resources, and we'll touch on that for a bit in, a, in just a bit. Um, getting back to the purpose of the maps, um, maps that are submitted with red list assessments are what's called um, uh, field guide maps. We, we have a very specific set of criteria for what these maps are intended to display. Um, and it's really critical that you start with that understanding when you're making your map. It'll make things so much easier. Um, so when we talk about field guide maps, what we really want is a map that encompasses the species' entire range, um, but doesn't necessarily reflect density. And it doesn't necessarily mean that every place displayed on the map actually has the species present. So there may be areas of your map that are coded as the species is there, but they're not actually there. I could have a terrestrial species with a small lake and I don't bother to cut out that small lake and that's fine. Um, we're, uh, we're making these maps with the intention of making sure that all observations of the species fall within the polygon that you draw. Um, that's really the big criteria that we're looking for here. Um, if you end up not cutting out little chunks of map uh, where the species isn't present, that's much less of a concern. What we don't want is to have a map um, that's used for conservation projects later down the road um, that doesn't actually encompass the species' entire range. So it's better to err on having too much area map than to have too little area mapped. Um, and starting from that point, that perspective is really, really helpful. There's a lot more information on what, uh, what these maps are for and how to make them in the IUCN Red List Mapping Guidelines or Mapping Standards and Data Quality document. This is available on the IUCN Red List website at iucnredlist.org. Um, and uh, there's a link that we'll drop, Anna just dropped it in the chat. So if you look at the chat box, that's a link directly to this document. 
Um, this is going to be your go to resource and I suggest that if, if you have any future questions about mapping, this is the first place you should go um, with those questions. Uh, this will really, really help you um, to understand and conceptualize what elements are required. Um, and it'll really help you figure out how to code in attribute fields. This has very detailed documentation on how to express different um, uh, pr presence and origin codes for your map, um, what areas to map, what areas not to map. Uh, and and uh, But it does not cover technical details and technical aspects of how to make a map. So this is a really good philosophical document on why there's a map uh, and, and what is required for submission. But it doesn't get you all the way there for how you actually go through to create that uh, that digital document. Um, and that's what we're here to do today. So today uh, I'm going to cover the basics of GIS, sort of what is GIS, um, which software package might be right for you. Uh, so this is a, a big issue that we have is that a lot of people think that ArcMap is the only way that they can make a map, or they don't know how to use QGIS, or they don't know how to use one of the open source options. Um, or they don't know which one to start with. And so we have a lot of people who can't get started on a map because they don't know how to use the software and they don't know which one to pick. We're going to help you learn, you know, which which software package that is right for you and which one you should get started with. Uh, we'll also discuss sources of data that are acceptable and sources of data that can help you make a map. Um, we're going to get touch a little bit on how to import data into GIS platforms. Um, and most importantly, I'm going to give you a, a basic rundown of the tools and functions that are used to make a map for the IUCN Red List. Um, so once you've got a software package chosen and you've got kind of the vocabulary to search for the training that you need to, to use that GIS package, um, you'll have all the tools that you need to sit down and in the span of an afternoon make your first map. Um, it's a bit of a learning curve to use some of the software. And so, uh, you know, going through how to make a map in every software package is going to be beyond the scope of this, this webinar. Um, but we want to give you the tools to empower you to go out and learn how to do it yourself and, um, and, and be successful and not have a really frustrating time um, fumbling with GIS software and, and trying to find the right way to search for what you want to do. Um, I'll also give kind of a really quick rundown of an example species of how to map it. Um, and then we'll take some questions. And, and again, uh, feel free to drop questions in the Q&A anytime. Um, Anna can address some of those and, and we'll address some of them um, that are particularly relevant for everyone. So first off, what is GIS? Um, GIS stands for Geographic Information Systems. Um, and the history behind it is relatively recent. Um, it's strongly associated with the field of epidemiology. Uh, the two earliest applications of GIS were by Charles Piquet in Paris and John Snow in London. Um, both were studying the incidence of cholera in an attempt to address outbreaks in their respective cities. Uh, Piquet examined the number of cholera cases in each of Paris's districts, and you can see his map up here on the right. Um, this was made in 1834, and he made a heat map showing where the, the um, disease had the most uh, cases. Um, Snow created the map on the left in 1854 um, and mapped the incidence of cholera as a bar graph overlaid on the Soho neighborhood of London. Uh, relying on this data, he identified a single well as the source of the outbreak, removed the pump handle, and the outbreak ended. Um, and so these kind of give you an idea of what GIS looks like at the very basic level, which is important for kind of breaking down the barrier to entry. So at its most basic, um, a GIS is, is simply geographic data linked to some sort of other data. In most cases, it's linked to a table of some sort or a database. Um, in modern iterations, uh, this, is, this is exactly the same as you see in those examples from the 19th century. It's simply data in some sort of table format, i.e. how many cases of cholera there are in a particular neighborhood linked to the geography of that neighborhood. So we can say that this data point is associated with this place. Um, in, the, in, in the slide that you see now, you can see a modern GIS um, application that's opened up. Um, we've got some uh, spatial data that's in the map, and in the foreground there, you've got a data table which is associated with 
that geographic data. It's exactly the same as before. Um, it's exactly the same as the 19th century iterations. It's just easier to use. Um, by linking the data in this way and having the geographic data tied to a table, we can perform really complex spatial calculations, determine very quickly um, uh, where species distributions overlap. Uh, we can determine where species are present, where they're absent, and we can perform calculations on the rates of decline. Um, so it's really the perfect application to use for uh, the IUCN Red List. Any discussion of maps would be incomplete if we didn't talk about projections. And this is a thing that really trips up a lot of people early on in GIS. And what I really want to emphasize is that projections don't have to be complicated and that it can actually be very, very simple to use them in a GIS. Um, uh, what is a projection? Well, maps are abstractions of reality, which present a spherical object, the Earth, or a roughly spherical object, on a flat surface. Um, so different means of transforming that data from spherical to flat result in different distortions, which must be considered when performing calculations on spatial data. This is really important when you're calculating extent of occurrence or area of occupancy, um, because GIS uh, software, modern GIS software, will often not warn you or um, it will perform calculations that don't make sense if you have things in the wrong projection. Um, so when you're calculating EOO or AOO, um, it's very important that the shape files that you're working on are reprojected into equal area projections, meaning every area on the map is the equivalent in area. Um, if you perform these calculations in a not equal area projection, you'll get a calculation. It'll give you a number, but the number will be incorrect. Um, uh, this is really, really important, and the, the thing that I'd like to emphasize most is that if you keep all of your data in the same projection at all times and just stick with an equal area projection, you'll be fine 99% of the time. Um, at the very end, you'll want to transfer everything to WGS84 for submission as outlined in the mapping standards guidelines. Um, so uh, we'll talk about this just a bit more. Uh, equal area projections, you can see one here. Um, distortions come in a few varieties and maps can preserve some elements while radically altering others. Um, you can see the familiar shapes of, of extreme northern and southern parts of the earth here are, are quite radically distorted. Um, the, especially Europe uh, is, is really flattened. Um, and so these are great projections for making calculations, um, but they're not great for viewing. Um, uh and yeah so so we might not want you know this might not be the most visually appealing but it's a great way to do your calculations this is a cylindrical uh equal area map that covers the entire earth um, which is great because you can perform very large calculations without having to worry about which areas are are equal area and which ones aren't um uh what else? Um, this is a great way to, to, to make sure that um, if, if you just do everything in a cylindrical equal area projection, you're usually fine. Um, and so I kind of encourage that. Uh, you can see a conic projection here. A lot of those are equal area as well. Um, these obviously distort shapes and directions. So you can see some areas where the, uh, you know, pointing up on the map, which we usually associate with north, um, is not north, it's east or west, depending on where you're at. Um, and when in doubt about a projection, just keep in mind that you, uh, you need to consider which properties um, you need to preserve for a given calculation. If you're measuring distance, you should use an equidistant prediction, uh, projection, one that where all measurements for distance will be equivalent. Um, if you're measuring area, make sure that you perform all those calculations in an um, uh, equal area projection. Okay, um, let's get into some uh, some software packages that you can use and sort of some of the ups and downs of each one. Um, this is intended to help you decide which software to use. You may have access to some of these software packages and you may be familiar with them. And if so, bear with me a little bit. Um, so the most common ones are Esri products uh, by quite a wide margin. These are the most popular GIS platform. Uh, it's well-developed, stable, um, and there's numerous resources and training opportunities. However, it's very expensive. Um, so licensing options range from a basic personal account, which is about 100 US dollars per year, um, 
into corporate accounts that run many, many thousands of US dollars per year. Um, if you're with a university, you may have access to some of this, the, these programs um, through that, uh, and you may wanna consult whether that's an option for you. Um, if you don't have access to a license for ArcGIS products or Esri products, um, there are a lot of other options. So if this price tag deters you, then there's no need to follow through and, and purchase it. Um, there's, there's other options that uh, will suit your needs just fine. Um, I saw in the, in the Q&A, there was a question about QGIS um, and we'll talk about QGIS pretty extensively here. Um, I highly recommend it. Uh, please use QGIS. You can absolutely submit your maps through QGIS um, and, and that's not a problem at all. Um, ArcGIS Desktop uh, has two different versions. Um, so there's two major packages. ArcGIS Desktop is the suite of applications, including ArcMap. Um, they're used to organize, create, and modify spatial data sets. Uh, the programs can be a great way to make species maps, but they're being phased out. Um, so Esri is phasing these out likely in the next five years, and they'll be moving everything to ArcGIS Pro. Um, ArcGIS Pro is a single program which can do all of the functions that the ArcGIS desktop package could do. Um, and it's much more streamlined and easier to use. Uh, if you have access to Esri products, um, you have a license available, and you need to learn how to use it, I highly suggest starting with ArcGIS Pro um, because that's going to give you greater value. That, that knowledge will be valuable for much longer um, uh, with, with ArcMap being phased out. Um, both products can be used to make whatever maps you need. Um, so the, the, in terms of functionality for making an IUCN red list map, um, both of these will, will perform perfectly adequately. If you're not interested in spending thousands of dollars annually on a license, um, there are plenty of other options and we'll discuss some of the pros and cons of each of these. Um, these are all free open source software packages. Uh, they, they don't cost a cent. Um, and they can perform all of the functions that uh, the proprietary packages made by Esri can make. Um, in many cases, using one of these packages will be your best option, depending on your budget and your skill with various aspects of GIS. Um, Google Earth is perhaps the most common. Um, Google Earth Pro can be used to create polygons suitable for species mapping. However, the program is not a true GIS. Um, so we have the, the spatial data, but there isn't really a database associated with it. Um, it, it has a lot of the, um, uh, it lacks some of the functionality of other programs. And Google Earth Pro uh, can't link tables to the spatial data in the same way that other programs can. It's also not possible to clip polygons to coastlines or other features, which can make it unsuitable for mapping species, especially species with a coastal distribution. Um, Google Earth Pro is, is perfectly adequate, and if you're comfortable using it, you can make a map and, and feel free to do so. Um, there are other options that are much better that can be learned relatively quickly and that are also free. Uh, so I don't recommend using Google Earth Pro, but if you already do use it, feel free to continue. Grass GIS is another option. Um, it's a fully functional GIS software package that's really well developed. It's got a user interface that's easy to use. Um, uh, I'm seeing a question here about recordings. Yeah, we will record this and we'll make it available um, for future dates. So um, uh, we'll also have some notes and some uh, details with uh, links. So you'll, you'll get the links that are provided in this um, platform. Uh, so GrassGIS, uh, it's a bit difficult for new users. Um, I'm not particularly familiar with how to use it. Uh, if you know how to code or you're, you're really computer savvy, it might be a good option for you. Um, there, but there are many free training opportunities that are available. Uh, there, there's uh, incredible videos. Um, there's a wealth of knowledge on exactly how to use it. Uh, it. It can absolutely perform all the needs that you need for a um, Red list assessment. Another option is called PostGIS. Um, this is an extension of a database software called Postgres uh, SQL. So if you're familiar with databases or you can co uh, or, or you can uh, understand how to uh, do SQL uh, database management, um, this would be a really good option for you because it uses all of those same commands and it's much, much easier to use if you understand how to use databases. Um, 
if you have very, very large data sets, this might be a good option as well. Um, so I'm talking millions of, of data points. This might be a really good option. Um, it may require some knowledge of SQL. If you're not, you know, savvy with, with SQL programming, this is probably not a great choice for you. Um, again, there are training resources that are comprehensive and free, um, and we'll, we'll drop that link into the chat for you. Um, PostGIS is, is a great resource. It's just, again, it's a bit difficult to understand if you're not using, um, if you're not familiar with SQL programming languages. Um, R, uh, there were a, a number of questions in the registration about R, um, so we'll spend a little bit of time speaking about it. Um, it can be used for various GIS functions, um, but the user interface is not particularly well developed. Uh, you, you basically have to know how to code in the R programming language to use it appropriately. Um, you can get by with limited R knowledge. I, I've used it a little bit. Um, and many packages are developed specifically for use with the IUCN Red List assessments. So Red, Con R, R Red List, uh, Red Lister, and RCAT, all of those programs are designed specifically for this purpose and, and um, for, for writing an assessment. However, uh, they're not necessarily designed for making maps, and I'm not aware of any package that is. Uh, so um, you you may be able to use this data when you're writing an assessment, but it's probably not particularly helpful for um, making a map. One of these packages, Con R, will export shape files, and a lot of people have asked me about whether it's possible to use um, Con R to make maps. Uh, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit of detail because I'm hoping to answer that question for several people. Um, so if you're mapping with Con R, this is a map of a species that I, I did by hand using another GIS platform. Um, and you can see that our species distribution is, is modeled here with the presence and origin codes are included. Um, so we can see these green areas are where the species is native and extant. Uh, the blue areas are where it's native, but the presence is uncertain. And the purple areas are where it's been introduced, but it's still extant. Now, um, feeding this exact same data into um, R, uh, Con R, we can see the maps that it produces. Um, and they're wildly off. Um, so this species has been introduced in a number of places, and it's very, very common in horticultural markets, so it's widely distributed. Um, you can see some of these invasive, or not invasive, but introduced populations, especially in the east coast of North America. And there's a few on the west coast of North America, there's some in Europe, and there's even some down in Colombia. Um, the exported shapefile that Con R gives you is this large pink area, which is clearly not correct. We've got large areas of the North Atlantic, which, which are not suitable. Um, what we've calculated here is the minimum convex hull, useful in calculating the extent of occurrence, but it's not particularly useful as a map. Um, so this is not something you would want to submit. Uh, you could use this as a base to come up with, you know, uh, something else, um, but manipulating it in R is going to be very difficult, and it's probably going to be time consuming, and it's not going to be worth your time. Um, you're going to want to use another software platform for this. Um, there's another output that you can use with Con R uh, that will make uh, it will ma map your distribution based on a buffer distance for the points that you input, um, and so it'll output subpopulations based on that buffer distance. Uh, you can see the orange on this map is where we've modeled those subpopulations. However, um, our buffers introduce still areas of, of the coast where um, it appears that our uh, species occurs offshore. This is a plant, so it doesn't. Um, we have also got areas where there's introduced populations that are almost impossible to get rid of in R. Um, and we've made no distinction between our introduced populations uh, along the northern uh, coast of the Gulf of Mexico from our native populations along the Atlantic coast. Um, all in all, I, I really strongly suggest not trying to map things with R. It may be possible to make it, uh, to accurately screen your data, clip it to coastlines and make it work, but it's gonna be much more time consuming than using other methods. Um, the lack of user interface is gonna make this process really, really difficult even for experienced users. Um, and it may be a suitable program for some advanced users, 
but if you're an advanced user of R, you, you are going to be able to use other platforms more effectively. Um, all right, moving on, uh, QGIS. Uh, QGIS is the package that I really strongly recommend that everyone use. I have access to an Esri account and I still use QGIS anyway because it's easier. Um, it's free, it's open source, it's uh, the, the resources that are available to support QGIS users have grown dramatically in recent years. It has the same functionality that you're gonna get in um, ArcGIS uh, Pro or ArcMap. Um, if you're new to GIS and looking to make maps, this is where I would start. Um, it's again, free. Uh, it also has a variety of plugins that can be obtained again for free. Um, and these have some tools that uh, could be useful for mapping. Um, we're also currently working on replicating the tools that exist for the IUCN and ArcMap. There's an ArcMap toolbox that's uh, specifically designed for the IUCN that creates EOO and calculates AOO. Um, and what we're going to do is try to replicate those for QGIS so that uh, QGIS users can use that exact same functionality, which really streamlines some things. So um, there's also a lot of base resources that are available on the IUCN website. Um, if you, uh, this is a quick video that'll guide you right to it. Uh, if you go to IUCNredlist.org, the, the Redlist website that we're all familiar with, on the upper right corner, you'll see a button that says resources and publications. Um, if you click on that and scroll all the way to the bottom, um, this is a little bit slow. Um, you can see the mapping standards document at the top there. And then at the very bottom, there's a spatial data and mapping resources button. Uh, in there, there's a GIS tools, software, and recommended base data page. And on this page, you can see uh, there's the mapping standards and guidelines again. There's the toolbox for ArcMap, an EOO calculator, um, some batching tools for use in ArcMap, base data, an empty polygon shape file, which is very, very helpful. Um, some basic uh, base data for with rivers and, and coastline data, elevation data, bathymetry data, um, the hydro basins that are used for freshwater maps, which we won't get into detail today, but they're, they're done in a slightly different way. Um, there's some training opportunities that are linked here. So if you want to learn how to use QGIS, this is a great place to start. Um, there's some resources for R that are available. And then down at the bottom, we've got some data providers like Blue Habitats, um, which is useful for um, uh, Blue Habitats is great for some marine data. It shows you know where seagrass beds are versus um, different underlying substrates and depths. Um, there's another free GIS data website there that has a lot of other data sets which may be useful to you. Um, GBIF is linked here. GBIF is where a lot of us get our data for assessments and it's great for mapping. Um, and then there's a few other data sets here as well. Um, I highly recommend going here as a good starting point if you're new to GIS and you really want to make a map. This is a great place to start. This base data is going to keep your data consistent with all of the other IUCN red list assessments. Um, so if you consider clipping a species to the coastline, you're, you're really just cutting your area off and deciding where a beach is. It's great if we all use the same definition of where those beaches are. Um, and that way all of our maps will line up perfectly and you don't have all of these um, the feathery edges or things like that. All right. Um, data sources. Uh, for base data, as I said, the IUCN website is a great place to get hydro basins, coastlines, waterways, elevation, bathymetry. Um, point data can be obtained from GBIF, from museums, from herbaria. You're likely already obtaining this data when you're making your assessments. Um, Blue Habitats, as I mentioned, has, has um, some information on substrates that's, that can be helpful. A lot of the marine biodiversity assessments that have been done so far don't utilize this data because it's, it's kind of marginally helpful. Um, but it may be helpful in your case. Um, eco regions are available for most of the earth at the level three level. Uh, for North America and Europe, you'll be able to find the level four data. Um, for whatever country you may be in, there's likely to be that data as well um, at a finer grain detail. Um, feel free to use those. That's, it's a great way to, to dial in your species to a particular habitat where it might exist. Um, also consider images. Uh, there are ways, and we'll discuss this a little bit in detail in a bit, 
um, to digitize paper maps. So if you've got a book that's from the 30s that has the species distribution in it, um, you can scan that in and you can use a GIS application to make that into a digital copy. It's relatively simple. Um, it doesn't take a lot of time and we'll show into we'll, we'll show you how to do that in uh, a little bit of detail in just a second. Um, let's see, uh, does the IUCN spatial data contain a standard forest cover that can permit uh, assessments for deforestation rates? Um, I'm not aware of a, a, a time series database that's on the IUCN website, but those do exist and there are some with global coverage. Um, and if you, there, there's plenty of GIS repositories out there that have data like that. Um, unfortunately, the time series data is not on the IUCN website. Um, that, that, that's uh, uh, something a little more specialty that you're gonna have to look for. Um, but again, that that's, data does exist. Um, there's a lot of it is available based on um, raster data from satellites. Um, and some Google searching will, will find it for you pretty quick. Um, Using it might be a little bit more technical though, if you're looking at deforestation rates. Um, rates can be really difficult to calculate from that, um, that data, but if you're looking at just two time points at a particular area, um, that might be suitable for your needs. Um, all right, moving on a little bit. Uh, data formatting tips. So uh, follow the coding schemes outlined in the mapping standards document. Um, that's again, the first place you should be looking for these. Uh, be sure to fill out all the necessary fields or your assessments will get held up um, and it'll take much longer for them to be published. Uh, clip to coastlines where necessary. I see so many maps submitted to the red list that have huge sections of, of the ocean for terrestrial species or huge sections of the land for marine species, and it's just totally not suitable. Um, clipping these data is really, really fast once you learn how to do it. Um, take the time to learn how to do it in whatever um, platform you're using and use that data from the IUCN Red List to uh, website to, to clip your data. Um, it makes really, really fast work um, and your maps look great. File formats. Uh, so this is kind of a question that came up a bit earlier. Uh, submit shape files wherever possible. Um, so all of the, the platforms that I mentioned are GRASS, QGIS, all of them except Google Earth. Um, can export a shapefile, but other sh shape uh, other file formats are are totally acceptable as well. Um, there's JSON files. There's a number of others that'll work, and we can convert those. However, uh, the Red List unit is really really overworked, um, and they would very much appreciate it if you convert it into shape files before you uh, submit it. Um, it's a really really simple process, and like I said, uh, QGIS or or any of the others except for um, uh, Google Earth can do that. Google Earth will make files called KMZs, um, and KMZs can be submitted to uh, the, the Red List as well. Um, those are going to take a little bit longer to process, so uh, if you submit shape files, your assessments will get published faster. If you submit, submit KMZs, they're going to take time to go through processing, and if a lot of people are submitting KMZs, your assessments might get bumped until the next update. Um, so it can be make things a little bit faster. Um, yes, there is a standard coastline layer uh, that the IUCN uses and, or, or recommends for consistency. Um, it's available on that, uh, that resources page um, that, I, that I showed you earlier. Um, there's a series of those at different resolutions, um, and you, whatever resolution you choose might be, uh, is going to be based on the, the level of your assessment. So that's sort of up to you. There's a few resolutions that are available. Um, there's a level three resolution in that. That's the one that I use. Um, tends to be, it looks great. Um, and it matches up pretty precisely with the coastline layer on the website. So your, your assessments look pretty good. Okay, um, finding point data. Species occurrence data is available from a number of sources, herbaria, museum specimens, observational data, community science platforms. Um, all of these might be useful for making your assessment. Uh, many sources export their data in Darwin Core format, which is a format that's standardized across various organizations. Um, it's a great way to use these, uh, and it's a great way to analyze the data, but it has much more data that's used um, than the IUCN Red List requires. Um, so there's a slightly different format 
for the red list submissions. Um, you can find out more information about the, the formatting for the red list submissions in the mapping standards document. Um, and I highly recommend that you download the blank polygon from the red list website. Um, it's great. It's already formatted. It already has all of the columns that you need. Um, you really just need to put data into it. Um, it makes things much, much faster for you. Um, there's also another little trick that you can use here. Um, so you can see this is the GeoCat website that you may be familiar with. Uh, GeoCat is a uh, platform, uh, a web-based platform developed by Kew Gardens. Um, and you can upload uh, a CSV with the point data that you that you have from another source. Um, you can directly download GBIF data from it. And you can also, if you use this button down at the bottom right where it says download data, it'll give you the option to download it as an SIS file. If you're submitting point data associated with your map or just point data, which is appropriate for some um, specialist groups, especially the plant specialist groups, um, you can download, you can, you can do everything you need in uh, GeoCat. You can delete points, you can add points, you can, you can adjust all of everything that needs to be done and then download a .csv file that's already formatted for submission to SIS. Everything's already done for you and you can just submit that file. Um, this is also a great way that you can edit the points that you need before you import them into a GIS software package. So if you're not super familiar with how to use a GIS and you just need to know how to use a few elements, if you're just getting started, this is a great cheat that'll get you halfway there. So when you enter everything in, you've got a point, for, uh, a point file that's already formatted and done, um, and you can use that point file to make your polygon file. Um, so when you, this is a, a very, very helpful resource. I still do it. I've made thousands of maps at this point. Um, and this is still one of the fastest ways if you're making, you know, one species at a time. Um, you may need to edit the presence or origin codes, even when you're using this method. Um, and that's because the underlying data might not have that coded appropriately. Uh, so I've seen numerous species where it's introduced on one continent and it's not actually coded at the end of this as introduced at the end of that process. Um, so definitely take a look at that and keep that in mind while you're making your map. Um, importing point data. So most of the sources that we just discussed will export data in .csv tables. Uh, such tables can be imported into GIS software relatively easily, but most platforms require you to manually specify which columns to use for X direction and which to use for Y direction. Keep in mind that the point data that you have may be in a different projection from the one that you're using. Um, if, for example, your points are coded in UTM, you need to specify this when you enter your data um, and, and you upload it into your GIS software. Um, in most cases, it'll give you a nice, this is the, when you upload in QGIS, it, it comes up with this table that you see here. Um, and it gives you the option to specify your X field, specify your Y field, um, and you can define your geometry CRS. So CRS is coordinate reference system. Um, and that's really, really commonly used. Uh, that, that's what you're gonna use to define whether you're in a, a WGS projection or, or, or um, like a conical projection or a cylindrical projection or Mercator or something else. In some cases, the difference is minimal between coordinate reference systems. Um, so for instance, if your point data comes to you in NAD 83 um, and you need to submit it in WGS 84, uh, those two systems only differ by about one meter in most cases. Um, and for the purposes of mapping a species with a continental distribution, one meter accuracy is far better than necessary. Um, and you won't need to worry about it in the slightest. Um, in, in most cases, the difference will be well within the area or radius of the point uh, to begin with. And, and the difference can be totally disregarded. Um, but in other cases like UTM to WGS, you really do need to pay attention to that can't submit points and UTM coordinates to the, to the red list unit because they don't really know what they're getting. Uh, all right, so uh, I'm gonna go over some basic tools and functions. And again, the point here is to give you the vocabulary for how to search for these things. Um, so again, if you're new to QGIS, you're just starting out, you're new to ArcGIS, you need to know how to Google something just to figure out exactly what you're doing. Um, there are a million resources that are out there. And if you, you, if you can search for what you actually need to do, um, you'll very, very quickly find instructions for how to do exactly what you need to do in whatever software package you're using. 
Um, so again, we're just trying to get you the vocabulary so that you can find the answers that you need. Um, the basic tools and functions we're going to go over are clip, buffer, convex hull, dissolve, and smooth. Um, clip is the simplest of them all. It's fairly self-explanatory. We take an input layer uh, that you see here on the left, a clip feature, which you see in the center, um, and your output is the, the clip feature is used almost like a cookie cutter to clip your input feature and uh, leave you with the output feature. Um, this is really, really commonly used for um, coastlines. So if you have a terrestrial species that occurs near the ocean, you might want to clip the ocean off of it so that you are, you might want to clip to a land area so that the ocean areas are discarded. Uh, you might also do this for a national boundary. If you don't know precisely where a species distribution occurs, but you know, for instance, it occurs in Algeria, but not in a neighboring country, um, you can clip your species to the boundaries of Algeria and you can eliminate all of those areas that may spill over into neighboring countries where you know the species doesn't actually occur. Um, it may also be useful for lakes, rivers. Um, there's a number of places where you could use a clip feature to get exactly the, the area that you want. Um, the software will remove portions of the features which fall outside the clip area. Um, and, and you may also need the function intersect, which performs a very similar function and it might be useful for your purposes. Um, intersect will include some features of your clip feature. So if, for instance, your clip feature is two different areas. Um, those two areas, say it's divided right down the center, your output will also be divided right down the center. Um, in some cases, it's useful. It's a bit more advanced. Clip does basically the same thing. Um, buffer is another one that's really helpful. Uh, buffers draw a polygon at a given distance from another feature. That feature can be a point, a line, a polygon. It can be any of the, the vector files that we've been discussing. Um, and buffering can be useful for species known only for a type locality. So this is the, the uh, prescribed way to map a species that's only known from a single point. Just a buffer at a distance that's reasonable around it. You end up with a circular distribution that's just your best guess for where the species occurs. Um, in other instances, buffering can be used for a species, uh, for instance, along a water course. If you're mapping trees in a riparian forest, um, you might buffer just a river and you say that they occur within, say, a kilometer of the river, um, and that will be your map. Uh, there's a number of instances where buffer can be useful. Coastlines, if you have um, fishes that occur in shallow waters, you might buffer to a coastline and you only show the area um, within a certain distance of the coast. Let's see. Convex hull um, is uh, a function that's used to generate a minimum convex polygon around your species' distribution. Uh, when performing these calculations, be sure to include the appropriate areas. Um, so this might include some areas which are coded as it might ex exclude some areas which are coded as possibly extinct or where presence is uncertain. Um, and you can find a lot more detail about this in the mapping standards document on how to perform these calculations. Um, a lot of people are, are a bit confused as to how to do these this in the absence of the IUCN toolbox that's uh, available for ArcMap. Every software package that we've discussed so far can do this, and it's usually listed under Convex Hull. Um, Again, though, keep in mind, if you perform a convex hull um, uh, calculation outside of a, uh, an equal uh, area projection, the results that you'll get will be very strange um, and perhaps not applicable. Also keep in mind that if your species distribution crosses the international date line and occurs on in both sort of the, the plus 180 and minus 180 um, longitudes, uh, your calculations can be wildly off using this method. Um, GeoCAT has the same issue. Uh, for such distributions, what you can do is, um, uh, if you have a species that occurs kind of only in that area, you may try a different projection um, or a different coordinate reference system that is based in a different um, that, that splits in a different area. So there are coordinate reference systems that split along the prime meridian instead, um, which allow you to map those areas. If you have a species that occurs all the way around the earth, um, it's very, very difficult to deal with those. Um, and uh, the, the methods for dealing with that vary 
pretty dramatically. Um, in such cases, though, the the extent of occurrence is not quite as useful because you have you tend to have very large distributions at that point, um, and so rough estimates tend to be all right. Dissolve is the next one that we'll discuss. Um, dissolve functions allow a user to merge polygons within a map to create contiguous areas. Um, so in this case, we've got a circle and a square. We dissolve them based on some attribute, and we end up with a uh, merged one single polygon that includes both of those areas. It's also possible to merge your polygons based on presence codes or based on some attribute. So you can say merge all of my polygons which are coded as presence one and they all get merged into a single uh, uh, feature. Um, while your, your polygons are uh, um, coded as presence three remain a separate feature. Um, this is very, very useful in a lot of cases. Um, and this is one that uh, is underutilized when making these maps. Smoothing functions are also available in all of these packages. Uh, when you draw polygons, you'll be adding points manually. And often this makes a choppy or an irregular shape that's not visually appealing and perhaps not accurate. Uh, the smooth tool can help you create a more natural look to these um, and can, can get rid of those artificial corners and points that you've made. Um, drawing polygons. So your map may only be as precise as the underlying data. Um, this is a question that we get a lot is, is how do I map a species where there's not much data? Um, and the answer to that is you do the best you can with the data that you've got, which in some cases means drawing big circles that are relatively uncertain. Um, and what we want to really encourage people to do is it's okay to make these weird assumptions when you're making a map. So it's, it's okay to kind of make logical assumptions or, or leaps um, when there isn't much data to support what you're doing. You, you have to make a map, so we have to present something. Um, what is important is that you discuss the uncertainties and you discuss the methods that you use to make the map. Um, so I've made maps in the past where we really don't have a good idea where the species is. Um, we tend to really dramatically overestimate where the species might be because, again, the purpose of these maps is to map every area where the species could be. Um, we, we err on the side of mapping more area than is necessary um, so that we make sure that every possible you know, uh, individual falls within that polygon. Um, above all else, just document what you do with your map um, and describe the map making process. There's a field in SIS, um, the Species Information Service, where you can describe how your map was made. Um, we encourage people to write as much as you need to in there. Um, there's also a field in your uh, attribute table for source. Um, use this to cite the sources for your data. So if you're using five or six different sources, um, make five or six different polygons and cite different sources for each one of them. All right, so this is going to walk you through a really quick sample map. Um, and these, this is all fake data, so um, it, don't look it up. Uh, but what I'm going to do is sort of walk you through the process of I have a map, I have, this is the data that I have. How do I get from raw data to a map? Um, this is a species that's a mouse, which inhabits high altitude meadows just north of me here. Um, it's known from a single volcanic caldera and has not been observed elsewhere. Um, there's some point data that's available and you can see it presented here in the purple dots. We've got our volcanic caldera, which is visible on our topographic map. Um, we know our mouse is in here, but we don't really know much more than that. Given this data, what we can do is simply uh, draw our map around the entire caldera. If we know that the species occurs in the caldera and not outside of it, we can do the very simple task of, of just follow the ridge line all the way around the edge, and that's our map. Um, we then go in and code in all of the necessary attribute fields. In this case, our presence is one, our origin is one, and we've used some resource. Uh, our, our citation here should always be um, the citation for the map itself. Uh, so this is not the sources that you're using um, to make the map, this is this is who made the map. So this might be you. Um, this might be the IUCN Red List, which is the default. So it'll default to IUCN Red List 2022 or whatever you're you're making your map. Um, there's another field for source, which you can use to cite the data that you um, use to make your map. 
Um, we might also know more about it. So, so if we go back, uh, we said that the species occurs in high altitude meadows. If we have a little bit more data, in this case, I can look up the ecoregion data that we mentioned earlier. Um, and looking up this ecoregion layer, we can see there's a, uh, a feature here that really, really well coincides with our um, data. So this, this species occurs entirely within this ecoregion. It's almost as if the data is fake and I made it up. Um, in this case, this, uh, this ecoregion corresponds to grassland parks. So these are the meadow habitats where we know the species occurs. And using this habitat data, rather than drawing our polygon around the, the edge of the caldera boundary, um, we can actually be much more specific and use that habitat data to say this is where the species actually occurs because this is the appropriate habitat for it. We can eliminate these sort of peaks that are within the, the caldera um, as they're not meadow habitats and they're not suitable. In this case, what we can do is directly copy this polygon out of that um, shapefile and put it into our shapefile for our species and then code in our attribute table as necessary. Um, if, for instance, we're, we're worried, we're concerned about some of these species, we don't know how good our, our um, ecoregion data is, we don't know how good our, our habitat map is, we think that there might be some, some extra suitable habitat nearby, we can actually buffer this and, and expand out the polygon to incorporate some of that suitable habitat that we think might exist. Um, so buffering might be helpful for this. Uh, and, and again, if you look for some of these this habitat data that's appropriate for the species that you're using, um, you may be able to make these maps very, very quickly because you can pull out the habitat data specifically. Um, in other instances, we might have paper maps. Um, so in this case, I've got a map that someone else made. Um, it, it exists as an image, uh, but I don't have the underlying digital data um, and I don't have access to it. Uh, we might also wish to combine several paper maps. So I've done this numerous times. You've got, you've got um, say, for example, a species distribution is well mapped in Poland, um, and another resource that has it well mapped in Germany. Um, they're two separate paper maps, and you need to combine them, but you don't have the underlying data. Um, especially useful if you've got an, you know, an old book that you're using. Uh, this can be accomplished through a process called georectifying. Uh, so this process warps the paper map and applies it to a coordinate reference system based on control points. Um, control points are uh, points that are known with spatial position that can be found on your paper map and which you can also find on a, a, a map that's been georeferenced, so a, a, a base map of some sort. In this case, um, I'm going to use the intersections between the political boundaries here. So if we take points that are very, very distinct and discrete, um, like for instance, this corner or where three states meet um, or where we have these, you know, really, really distinct boundaries. You may also find cases where um, uh, intersections of roads can be really useful. Um, intersections of rivers or water courses can be useful for these control points. And it's very important that you spread the control points out as much as possible. Um, so if I'm georectifying this map and I only use points from over this side of the map, I might get really good accurate results here, but the rest of my map might still be really, really distorted. Um, so what you really want to do is take things from uh, extreme corners. So, you know, the northernmost point, the southernmost point, the easternmost point, the westernmost point. Um, that's going to help you warp these maps effectively and get the right uh, range. All right, so in this case, once I've got my paper map, I'll import it into my GIS and then I'll add my control points. And underneath it, you can see this coastline uh, is my base map. And you can see that it actually lines up pretty well. Um, it's now situated over the actual area. And you'll note that the southeastern corner doesn't match up quite precisely. You can see this, there's gray areas that sort of stick out beyond my map here. And that's because I didn't use control points down here um, effectively enough. Uh, so what you really want to do is make sure that you spread those out as much as possible. Once I've got my 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 map geo rectified, so it's it's attached to some sort of map with um, with coordinate data associated with it. Uh, what I can then do is draw in my polygon, and in this case, I have drawn in 
you'll note that I've drawn the boundaries along the edge of the species distribution inland um, quite precisely. And then out in the ocean, I've just drawn things out as far as I need to. And that's because in the next step, I'm going to clip it to the coastline. Um, so our original polygon here on the left shows uh, this purple area just extends way out into the sea. I've used the IUCN's base coastline file here. And when I clip, uh, I can remove all of the ocean areas. Um, and, and we're left with just uh, the species' actual distribution, which looks quite a bit like that initial map. Um, you'll note that I've also divided it out here into two different areas. One is, you know, this, this may be useful for a species where um, if the presence differs in one part of the range versus another. So this area could be presence uncertain and this area could be extant. The final step to this is going to be filling out the attribute table. So again, I've got my data coded in here. And I might say that this uh, this area is, is um, presence equals three, and in this area, presence equals one. I've also filled out the necessary components for seasonality, uh, the compiler, the year compiled. Um, and I, I, I want to really emphasize that the column for binomial, where you enter the species, uh, the genus and species, the, the Latin binomial for the species, um, be very, very careful to double check that on all of your assessments because the spelling on that must match precisely with the assessment in, I, uh, in SIS. That's the field that's used to link up your map to your assessment. Um, if a species' name is spelled incorrectly, you could, have a, you could have some instances where a certain feature gets dropped as it gets uploaded. Um, be very, very cautious to make sure that those are spelled correctly in all of your assessments and that they match exactly what's in the SIS. Um, if you put in a different taxonomy for that, and uh, it, it could cause a, a, a lot of problems. Um, so if you use a, a synonym for your species, um, you, you could be in trouble. All right, um, it can also be really helpful to create a workflow. Uh, so uh, if, if I have a complex map that I'm making, um, this is a really, really good place to start. I might start by importing a polygon template. So this is my basic uh, blank template that's available on the Redlist website. I might georectify a map for region A and then draw a polygon for region B based on habitat availability, then smooth my polygons, then clip to the coastline, then fill attribute table, then check the shapefile meets the standards. You'll note that the order of these can be very, very important. So for instance, if I clip to coastline and then smooth the polygon, I will smooth the, co the coastline as well. And that'll cause serious problems that can cause your, your um, coastline to not match up with the actual coastline. Um, and it's very, very easy to do this on accident, especially the first few times you're making a map. Um, I've had numerous instances where I'm, I'm putting together the data and I forget to draw the polygon for region B. And by then I've already smoothed and clipped my other parts of the distribution of the coastline, which makes it much more difficult to go back and do that for only a part of the map later. I highly recommend at least the first few times you make a map, you start with this. Um, start with writing out what you're going to do um, and try to figure out the terms that you need to, to search. So um, I'm using QGIS. I uh, need to smooth polygons. Um, you just search for smooth polygons in QGIS and you'll get a number of tutorials that'll show you precisely how to do it. Um, this is a, a great way to help yourself find the resources that you need um, to, to finish up your map. Um, and with that, I think we're gonna move on to just questions. Um, so I'll leave, we've got about 30 more minutes available. Um, and if anyone has any questions, please feel free to address them and, and we'll, we'll see what we can do to come up with um, specifics for whatever questions you've got. I do wanna just mention quickly, I just dropped a link for the IUCN Red List website in the chat. And that's where you'll find this webinar as well as the other two webinars in this series. There was one back in April, the IUCN Red List criteria, your questions answered. And then there will be a third webinar in November, IUCN Species Information System, or SIS, Tips and Tools. So you will find the webinars at that website. Thanks, Anna. Um, speaking of, of SIS and tips and tools, 
Um, I, I will give a brief warning on, on something. Um, in SIS, there's an area where you, you theoretically could upload your map. Uh, do not use that. Um, that makes things really, really complex for the Red List unit, and it can very, very dramatically slow down their processes. Um, when you're ready to submit your maps, contact the Red List unit. So um, email Carolyn Pollock or Janet, um, and they will help you find a way to submit your maps. Um, typically, we'll use a, a file sharing program, so you can use something like a Google Drive. Um, it's very, very quick. You can upload all of your data, and they can download it very quickly as well. Seeing fewer questions than I expected. And feel free to reach out to Clay or I as well if any questions come up later. Right, I'm happy to to answer questions later. Um, I'm, I realize that I'm opening myself up to a deluge if I offer to be the IUCN's GIS tech support, but um, I suppose that's a risk I'm willing to take. Um, once you've sort of done one map, um, the rest go much much faster. Um, so what I what I really encourage you to do is is reach out to someone who has some GIS experience and see if they can walk you through that first map. Um, the other thing that we haven't really discussed here is uh, freshwater mapping. Um, so if any of you are mapping freshwater species, it's really important to keep in mind that um, that process is quite a bit different. Um, so when you're mapping freshwater distributions, those are mapped based on hydro basins. Um, if you're mapping based on hydro basins, there's a really, really good tool called the, um, the, the freshwater mapping application that's available on the Red List website. Um, that can walk you through that. So you can actually make those maps without any sort of GIS software and without installing it. Um, let's see, how do you add on ranges missing from IUCN published distribution? Um, does it have to go through uh, species working groups? Um, yes, yes. So you're going to need to go through um, uh, your specialist groups, the relevant ones. Um, we can update some of these assessments, so it may not necessarily need to go through the same processes to get there. Um, in theory, we can just add the map on, especially if it's the same author and the same reviewers and things like that. Um, if you have a, a series of species that you want to work with, um, definitely reach out to the relevant specialist group and talk to them about how, how to go about adding those maps. Um, maps are required for new assessments. Um, but as you note, there are many, many thousands of old assessments that do not have maps. Um, we're hoping that as those species get reassessed, each one will get new maps associated with them, um, and that that'll uh, you know expedite the process of having the spatial data for all of these species. Um, but as I'm sure everyone here knows, the the process of doing reassessments is quite slow, um, and it's not on the five to ten year timetable that we would all like it. Um, another question, are the presence codes standardized red list codes, uh, or is it something we can add? So current presence, direct current presence, anecdotal versus historical, direct and anecdotal. Um, they, the coding for presence codes and is the same standard for occurrence codes for country distributions used in SIS. Um, so those are identical. Uh, and they're laid out in the IUCN mapping application or mapping standards. Um, so yes, you, you cannot alter those for the presence field. However, um, the standard shapefile formats have attributes that do contain areas where you can discuss some of that. Um, so there are areas where you can add in notes and you can say, you know, I'm not sure about the species. Um, some of the other ones, especially with, with you mentioned historical, um, we can say presence uncertain for some of those. Um, we can say possibly extant. We can say possibly extinct, depending on how things work. Um, and you can get into a little bit more detail about that in other areas. Um, but definitely, if you're basing something on anecdotal evidence or you're basing something on habitat requirements, um, discuss that in, in your um, uh, statements that are associated with your map and your, your discussion of how you made your map. Um, so it's entirely possible if you have something that doesn't quite match those coding, you can kind of go with the best option that you've got. 
um, or the, the most similar code that you've got, and then discuss that at length in the text to describe how you went about making the map um, and what those codes mean in this particular instance. Um, got a question about explaining a little bit more about convex hull. So what kind were the criteria used to include or not include features in the maps? Um, if I'm understanding this correctly, the, the convex hull is um, basically the, the smallest area that doesn't have uh, oblique angles um, that can be used to make your map. Uh, and I may have messed that up. It's been a very long time since I've taken a geometry course. Uh, <laughs> Um, you're basically taking the minimum boundaries where all of the angles are less than 180 degrees, um, making a polygon around all of those. And that's what's useful for calculating the extent of occurrence. Um, so the EOO is um, discussed pretty extensively in the red list guidelines um, and calculating it via the convex hull is the best way to do that. Um, so in terms of what criteria to include and which features to include, um, there is a pretty extensive discussion on how to do this in the mapping guidelines. Um, and what you're going to want to do is include only places where you know the species occurs. Um, so if you have places where the presence is uncertain, if you have places where the species is possibly extinct, even if it's possibly extant, we don't include those when we're doing our extent of occurrence. And this is because the extent of occurrence is intended to measure uh, the risk to the species based on some, you know, um, threatening factor uh, and the, the distribution of that risk across space and time. We want to make sure that when we're measuring that area, we only measure the area where we know the species occurs. Um, so this is kind of a, a way to be conservative about it and make sure that that area is expressed in kind of the smallest terms possible. Um, However, uh, it's, when you're calculating EOO, you're going to make your convex hull, and then you're going to calculate the area of it. So that's sort of the nuts and bolts of how it's done. Um, I'm hoping that answers your question. If not, um, feel free to, to add in a little bit more. Natural barriers. Um, that's a very good question. Uh, we can, we can um, look into natural barriers in terms of, uh, like, we may have mountain ranges that separate species. Um, feel free to use some external data to actually uh, separate out those species. Feel free to um, use habitat requirements. I, I use those ecoregion data all the time to say um, the species can't possibly cross a desert or something. It can't possibly be in there, so we're going to cut that area out. Um, I, I, if you've got an idea of where these species can and can't go, um, feel free to use whatever data you have available to clip that or even to manually go in and draw it yourself. Um, it's entirely possible to go in and say, um, you know that a species doesn't occur there, you're the assessor, you're the expert. Um, it, it's totally appropriate for you to go in and, and clip out particular areas where you know the species doesn't occur, even if it's not based on um, underlying data sets from some other, someone else. Um, any reference study or tool related to wildlife corridors mapping? Um, th that's a great question. I, I don't have a good answer for that one. Um, I'm certain that that exists. I, I'm, I'm not. Um, I'm not familiar with one though. So um, apologies for that. I, I don't have a good answer for that. Um, I do know that there is some discussion of that in the um, uh, the key biodiversity area training. So there's, there's some of that. Uh, for calculating AOO and EOO, can I just use GeoCAT or do I have to use another program? Feel free to use GeoCAT. Um, if GeoCAT has all of the points that you need, by all means, uh, it's a very fast and effective way to calculate uh, your AOO and EOO. If your AOO is calculated in one way and your EOO is calculated in a different way, um, or, or, or if your AOO and EOO are based on different data sets than your map, that may be entirely appropriate. Um, it, it's better in most cases if your EOO is calculated based on your range map. Um, but in some cases, this is not possible. If, if there's technical issues, um, feel free to use GeoCAD. Um, but try to make sure that they line up as much as possible, um, uh, wherever possible. 
um, criteria for assessing endangered to critically endangered. Um, consult the Red List guidelines. There's lots and lots of information there. Um, I don't believe that a, a password is required to view the IUCN webinars. Um, we will make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, so I, I'll make sure that, that people have access to these without any sort of password. Um, do I suggest clip function in freshwater distribution? Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, when you're mapping freshwater distributions, do not you do not clip the hydro basins. Um, so you submit the hydro basins as their own unit. Um, you may have a hydro basin that includes vast areas where you know the species does not occur. Still, you're, you're still going to use the hydro basins. The hydro basins are standardized. Um, I didn't really get into the freshwater applications because in many respects, freshwater mapping is much, much more standardized and simple um, than other mapping applications. Um, so you, you're never going to clip those out, um, even, even when they don't necessarily reflect reality. Uh, however, what I will say is um, one common issue with freshwater maps is that they'll include disjunct areas of a river system um, where there's no obvious connection between them, but obviously they're in the same river system and that, that connection does exist. Um, so in some cases that may be correct. In some cases you may actually have some barrier that prevents um, say fish or snails or whatever you're looking at from getting from one place to another. It could be a physical barrier or a dam or something else. Um, but in many cases that's not actually the case. And when you're making these maps, one way to get around that and to accurately represent your species distribution is to use variable levels of um, the, the hydro basin boundaries. Um, so if you're making a map, this is a bit more complex, um, but it's a great advice if you're making lots of freshwater maps, is to uh, select all of your um, HUC-8 unit, which is HUC-8 is the, the level of unit that we use for um, hydro basins uh, for mapping. Select all of those where you know the species to occur and code those in as presence equals one. Um, you may then select the HUC-6 level or the, you know, some larger unit um, that encompasses more areas where the species might occur. And then you can use that HUC-6 unit to select your HUC-8 units that fall within that. Um, so you've got a bunch of areas that you know are interconnected river systems where the species might occur. And you can code those in as, as presence uncertain, or you can code those in in some other way to reflect the fact that um, you suspect that those species are, that your species of interest is in those watersheds, um, but you don't know that for certain. Um, so that using those different levels of the HUC can be a really useful way to figure out how, how to um, map watershed units for freshwater species. Um, is triangulation from radio telemetry relevant with mapping for IUCN? Absolutely. Um, if you've got telemetry data, please use it. Uh, um, the, any sort of presence, absence data, any sort of movement data that you can use, all of that can be used to make these maps, and all of that should be used to make these maps, if at all possible. Um, so I, I, I deal mostly with plants, and obviously they don't get around a whole lot, um, but radio telemetry data could be absolutely useful, not just for figuring out where the species is and is not and, and mapping it in, um, but that data can also be used to inform um, uh, migration patterns and figure out which areas should be coded as in transit, um, which areas should be coded in, in terms of breeding season versus non-breeding season. Um, and, and that data, please do use that. Um, that. That's very high quality data that we would love to see associated with these assessments. Um, how to map when only few locations are available as confirmed for the species um, and not sure for the rest uh, of the possible range. Face this problem when mapping for a national red list. This is an incredibly common problem. Um, so I've made dozens of maps where I'm not entirely certain where the species occurs. Um, and we have very, very few data points. And perhaps, um, especially when those data points are widely spaced, we don't really know where the species is. Um, and I'll note a, a couple of things. One, if the species is data deficient and we know very little about where it is, as in we have no idea where it is, um, those are the instances where we can actually not make a map. 
Um, so if, if we really genuinely don't know where the species is at all, um, it may be useful to just not make a map if the species is data deficient. If, however, the species is much more widespread, um, we know it's least concern, we know it's threatened, we have to assign it some sort of, of map. Um, the advice that I can give is to do your best. Um, so look at the habitat suitability for the species. You may choose to represent, you know, broad chunks of habitat where you think the species may occur. Um, and you can reflect that uncertainty in your map either by coding it um, with the presence codes. So you can say in the few sp places where we actually do have good occurrence data, you can map those in as we know the species is there and then map in everything else with some lesser degree of certainty, you know, presence uncertain. Um, if we have a, a good indication that the species probably is in those areas, um, you might want to map it in as present. So you might map it in as presence equals one. Um, but you can discuss the uncertainty in your assessment text and you can say, we don't really know where the species is. We think that it's in these areas um, and there's quite a bit of uncertainty in these particular areas. Um, and that text can help guide anyone using this map um, to, to use it appropriately. Um, so there are, like I said, this is a very, very, very common problem. Um, and if you run into instances where there's not, not a, a lot of available data, um, don't panic. This is a great time to, to discuss that in detail in your text. Um, all right, how about species distribution modeling? Is that important for IUCN Red List, global or national assessments? Um, so this, this addresses the, the previous question pretty well. Um, this can be a very uh, good application. Um, if you have species distribution modeling that's, that's appropriate, that uses the, uh, the right indicators, um, it may be helpful for creating a range map. However, what I will say is that um, you shouldn't rely on those too heavily, because especially where species are threatened. So you may have a threatened species where the habitat in theory is available. Um, you may have a species distribution model that predicts that it's in a lot of areas, um, but it's been extirpated from those areas, for instance, for, for reasons of you know, collection or, or hunting. Um, in those instances, we don't necessarily want to include those areas because we want our map to reflect the actual species distribution. Um, so uh, unless you have a really good reason not to rely on the distribution modeling, feel free to use distribution modeling. That's a, that's a great approach. Um, I've seen people use Maxent modeling um, really effectively to figure out where things are. Um, but again, you, you need to discuss how you use these um, tools, which tools you used, what data underlies your model um, and, and how you arrive at the conclusions that you came to. Um, as long as those are being discussed and as long as you're, you're, you're not making you know, wild assumptions, um, a lot of these are, are perfectly appropriate methods for making maps. Um, again, uh, habitat data is a perfectly suitable way for making these maps if, in the absence of other data. Um, it's also a great way, you know, we've discussed numerous times during this webinar, clipping things like the ocean. Um, that's really just a habitat clip. Um, it, it's just like any other. And if we have good modeling data that says that a, a species can't occur in a particular area, that's absolutely useful to, to refine our maps and to make new ones. Um, I will say that the distribution modeling is often conducted in um, raster format and all of the assessments that are submitted to the, the red list are in vector format. Um, so you may need to convert that in some way and there's a variety of ways to do that. All right, um, any more questions? We've got about 10 more minutes and I'm happy to stick around. Uh, anything at all? Let's see, do I recommend to include area of habitat in assessments? That's not required information um, for, for red list assessments. Um, so if you have that data, um, by all means provide it. Um, it can be useful, especially for assessments and planning. Um, you're welcome to include a lot of supplementary detail in an assessment. Um, and if you can measure that when you're mapping, um, that, that may be something worth including. 
um, but you need to be very specific about what you mean by area of habitat. Um, and it's important to make sure that we're not conflating that with area of occupancy or extent of occurrence, um, and that it's very clear in your assessment what you mean by that. In terms of mapping, um, it might be appropriate to use area of habitat in your map. Um, if there's some uncertainty, like I said, we we saw that example earlier of the, the mouse that occurs in meadow habitats, and we refined things down to the habitat based on you know, its area of available habitat. In that case, we had a pretty good indication and a small scale area that that was you know, the right thing to do. What I would avoid is using area of habitat using coarse grained um, habitat types on continental scales. Um, so if we're looking at something like um, uh, boreal forests, we might not want to apply that in Eurasia because you're going to cross the entire continent. We need to have some other data indicating that that's an appropriate use of the data. Um, let's see, uh, if we want to contribute in distribution mapping for IUCN Red List in the future, what are the prerequisites? Um, my suggestion is to take the Red List training course, which is available online. Um, at conservationtraining.org. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty comprehensive course. It takes about 20 hours. Um, it's free, it's open to everyone. Um, and once you've taken that course, you're sort of ordained as an assessor and that's the only prerequisite there is really. Um, if you're interested in, in distribution mapping for existing assessments, um, I would still recommend taking that course because it's going to give you a really good idea of the parameters that are used in the red list and, and how things get used. Um, I do have that. I can just type it in right now. Um, so conservationtraining.org is going to have uh, links to a number of, um, of other assessments or other courses. And the courses that you're going to want is the IUCN Red List trainer or the IUCN Red List um, assessor course. Um, it's got 16 modules. You may not need to use all of them. Um, so you're going to need to go through the base ones. But if you're not using SIS or, or there's some other thing, you're not doing national red listing, um, you, can, you can skip some of those. Um, which software do I recommend for insect mapping? Um, Again, the, your choice of software is gonna be based on not so much taxa. Um, I think any taxa can be mapped with any of the software packages that we've, we've discussed so far. Um, it's gonna be based on your budget, uh, your technical expertise, what's available, and um, kind of what, what you'd like to, to use. Um, I have yet to see a species that could not map, be mapped in QGIS. Um, that's the software package that I use. That's the software package that I recommend. Um, for insects, it's going to be absolutely appropriate. Uh, there's free software. Um, there's free plugins that are available that can assist with that. You may explore some of those plugins. They're, for all I know, that there's, there's something specific to insects in there as well. Um, that's going to be where you're going to have the best bet to, to really explore and, and to modify things and to make things um, your own. Uh, I highly recommend it. If you have access to Esri software and you don't need to pay for it, um, that's perfectly fine as well. Um, if you're looking for a software package specifically to map species distributions, I, I would not recommend paying for Esri products because there are, are just as good of open source software packages that are available. Um, and QGIS would be my recommendation, especially for someone new. Um, if you have complex models that you're in, that you're using, if you have a lot of experience with this, GRASS GIS may be more appropriate for you. Um, and, and again, if you have very large data sets, um, post GIS may be appropriate as well. Uh, but I've yet to encounter anything that couldn't be mapped in QGIS. Um, and that would be my, my, my first recommendation. All right, um, I've got about five more minutes. So last couple questions that we can answer. Um, noticed a few attendees have dropped off and that's great. Have a good night, a good morning, um, wherever you may be.
All right. Well, in the absence of additional questions, um, I want to thank everyone for your time. Um, again, if you have any questions uh, after the webinar, we'll we'll post this webinar um, available as a video on the Redless website, um, and so you'll have access to it in the future. Uh, we'll also post some notes that include um, uh, some some details. We'll include all of these uh, web links. Um, all of these are available on the Redless website as well. Um, so again, consult those mapping resources um, and you'll find a lot of, of detailed information that will help you very much. Um, the recorded version will be available on the Redlist website at um, the, the, the link is in the chat there at resources slash webinars. Um, we will uh, get the video up probably in the next two weeks. Um, I'll likely record the next one next week before and we'll upload them both at the same time. Um, Again, thanks everyone.